All right. Um, so thank you for, to the organizers for inviting um, me to this paper. So this is joint work with Alex uh, from the University of Sao Paulo, my colleagues Rory uh, and Giovanni and CG uh, at the University of Warwick. Okay, so as we know, there's an extensive literature on FX interventions, and a number of uh, presenters today have already uh, gone, gone in detail. And a less explored uh, channel is the role of intermediary constraints. So what role um, does global intermediaries that facilitate the supply of US dollars to emerging markets, how are their constraints amplifying or the effect of FXI? So we call this the dollar intermediation channel, and you can think of this as a specific case of the portfolio balance channel, but specifically applied to dollar intermediation. So we use a data set recently published by the uh, Central Bank of Brazil, and it includes uh, a long time series of FXI, uh, both spot and uh, swap interventions. And we want to test the dollar intermediation channel by looking both at the spot rate and also uh, CIP deviations. And we also show that our results are consistent with a simple model of uh, FX, FXI um, in a, where you have financial frictions in dollar intermediation. Okay, so just to motivate uh, the paper, there, um, there are a number of, of interventions in the data set. Just honing in on one intervention on August 27th, there are a couple of, um, there are a couple of interventions. There's one in the morning, which is an expected spot sale. And we call these interventions expected because the actual announcement of this was the night before. So, so generally expected interventions are announced uh, the evening before they, they actually intervene in the market. And this intervention was for 550 uh, USD million. And so here you find that while it had some impact on appreciating the real, then the real started to depreciate again. Um, and then the central bank was concerned about uh, the real being overvalued, and then they have an unexpected spot sale. And so this um, is announced and immediately auction, the auction happens and immediately at an market participants. And this was also of a similar amount, but we find that there's a more persistent appreciation of the real following the unexpected uh, spot sale. So this is important in our identification where we differentiate between expected spot sales and unexpected spot sales in, in our analysis. So the research questions are firstly, how does FXI impact spot rates? So obviously there's a large literature um, doing event studies on the spot rate and so our main contribution here is, is thinking about how the effectiveness of FXI changes with uh, intermediary constraints. And we also look at CIP deviations. And, and CIP deviations is, is used as a proxy for the scarcity of USD funding. So, so if we think that it's alleviating intermediary constraints, we should find that the absolute level of CIP deviation should reduce following the intervention. And this is still work in progress, but we, we are also interested in thinking about the signaling versus portfolio balance channel. So there's a large literature trying to uh, assess whether portfolio balance is what matters or signaling. And the dollar intermediation channel is principally a portfolio balance uh, channel. Okay, so for spot rates, we find um, there are effects um, of unanticipated uh, it spot sales, and spot, um, se so sale of USD reserves um, in the spot market is more uh, effective than swap sales, so selling USD and then repurchasing USD at the maturity of the swap contract. So we also find a difference between spot and swap uh, FXI. Um, for cross-border funding, we obviously don't uh, have an observable for that, but our proxy for cross-border funding is looking at CIP deviations, and we find that, again, the cell interventions do 
uh, re reduce the, the magnitude of CIP deviations, and that is essentially improving um, the efficiency of obtaining dollar funding in FX markets. And we find that these uh, are more effective in periods of uh, tight intermediary constraints, which again is in line with this scarcity of, of dollar intermediation. And so when um, intermediation is constrained, then FXI has more effect. Okay, so there's a large literature, um, and so many of you have contributed uh, to this in this room. I would say that our main contributions are doing intraday identification um, using this new uh, Brazil data set, um, which goes quite a long sample from 1999 uh, to the present. And we are essentially testing this dollar intermediation channel by showing the effectiveness of FXI with uh, varying intermediary constraints. And there are many literatures uh, that we contribute to, so both the uh, event study literature, there are also a number of papers in Brazil. Um, papers today have discussed the theory of FXI, and um, there's also CIP in emerging markets as well. Okay, so just to motivate uh, the framework, we have a simple model. It's effectively uh, based on the GABX majority, so we're not uh, innovating too much uh, for the model. Um, so we have the US as the home, Brazil as the foreign um, in, our, in our framework. Um, consumption is a function of non-tradables, home and foreign goods. And we also have this nice uh, tractability from, from, the, from GABX majority where Essentially, the imports and exports are given by these uh, parameters in the uh, utility function as well, or in the, in the consumption uh, function. And then Euler uh, equations are given as follows. So we have um, an, an intermediary that essentially is doing a type of carry trade. So they are um, essentially, think of them as being short in, in USD and then long in the foreign currency, which is the real in, in this model. However, they face an incentive compatibility constraint, um, and this gamma coefficient is a measure of risk-bearing capacity. Um, so a high gamma um, would essentially uh, mean that there's more uh, intermediary constraints in this model. So there's essentially, uh, you need, you have um, incentive to run away with funds when, when gamma is high. And so you can think of gamma being in uh, infinity as this uh, essentially, um, yeah, so, so low gamma implies high capacity, so I should, uh, sorry, just to rephrase. So low gamma is essentially the UIP case, but high gamma approaches financial otaki, right? So, so if you have a very high gamma, that's essentially an inefficient uh, intermediary and, and this tight intermediary constraints. And so this is the dollar intermediation by the intermediary. So this is essentially the net supply of dollars by the intermediary and it's uh, essentially a function of this uh, UIP wedge. So following um, their framework, we have essentially these balance of payment constraints in period zero and period one. And here we have this FXI variable, which is essentially, um, a, we classify that as a cell of USD by the cent, uh, Brazilian Central Bank. And we allow for um, a swap of a swap agreement. So if they sell USD at uh, period zero, so the ba uh, central bank is selling USD in period zero, then they buy it back in period one but we allow for two types of interventions. So if eta equals zero and there's no buyback, then it's just a spot sale of USD. And if eta equals one, then you have a swap where if you sell USD reserves at period zero and then you buy it back in period one and that's a swap. And these are our exchange rates based on whether it's a spot uh, FXI or swap FXI. And so what we find is that when you have the FXI, the exchange rate goes up, so that's effectively the real uh, appreciating uh, after the intervention when the central bank of Brazil is selling uh, USD reserves. But for a spot FXI, it's a more persistent appreciation, 
Whereas for a swap FXI, if you, if you sell USD reserves at time zero and then you buy it back at time one, you get a reversal of the exchange rate. So this is kind of a very simple way to, to differentiate between spot um, FXI and swap FXI. And we argue that spot FXI should have more persistent effects on the exchange rate. So a um, couple of very uh, uh, testable implications. Um, and FXI selling USD reserves leads to a, a, a real appreciation, and the effectiveness is increasing in intermediary constraints. So essentially, um, when gamma is high, we will find the amplification of the FXI on the exchange rate. Okay, and that's just summarizing the results for spot and swap FXI. The Effects on CIP, so here we uh, obviously, um, the, in, in this framework, we have a UIP uh, variable, but if we assume forward market efficiency, we can essentially link the UIP wedge to a CIP wedge. And so essentially the dollar intermediation should be a function of the CIP measure. So if, if the synthetic rate is much higher than the direct rate, so essentially the, the level of CIP is very high, we should expect more dollar intermediation. And so the question is that when, when you have FXI, that should reduce the amount of dollar intermediation by, by the intermediaries, and that should uh, lower the level of CIP. But of course, I just take it, it's a simplifying assumption, it's framework, and um, essentially we use forward rates in our empirical analysis um, when we do CIP. Okay, so now to uh, the, the data and definitions. So the way we measure CIP is we essentially think about a, a US rate, R, and say Brazil rate is R star, and we want to essentially hedge exchange rate risk with a forward contract. So you can either, say, invest in a dollar deposit or invest in a real deposit um, where you convert the dollars into real and then you reconvert back to dollars at the forward rate. And so CIP says that those two rates should be equalized. Um, a CIP violation is equivalent to a wedge in this uh, equation where we um, classify the CIP violation as the wedge um, X here. And we can, in log terms, express the CIP violation as the difference between a direct rate, which is, say, borrowing dollars direct, in direct uh, dollar funding markets, and a synthetic rate, which is, say, like borrowing in real and then swapping real into dollars in, in the FX uh, swap market. And so the way our CIP deviations measured is uh, Brazil rate is a uh, synthetic rate is higher than the direct rate, we will have a negative uh, CIP. Okay, so now um, to the data. So we have uh, this Brazil C Central Bank data on interventions from 1999 to 2023. Um, it includes all of the instruments. Um, so this includes spot purchase and spot sales of, of USD reserves. Um, it includes traditional and reverse swap. Um, and these swaps are essentially, um, for example, traditional swap will be um, swapping USD for real at the spot leg and then at maturity re-exchanging uh, the real for USD. Um, we also have an announcement date and here we have a high frequency timestamp which allows us to do the intraday analysis. Um, we also have an operational date, which is the date in which auctions take place. Now, we make an assumption that for unexpected interventions, like I showed in the motivating slide, the operational date is on the same day as the announcement. So, so when they um, announce, they immediately uh, start the auctions. Um, for expected interven interventions, the operational date is at either the day before or days or multiple days before the uh, operation. Um, sorry, so the, uh, the operational date is days after the announcement. Okay, so uh, just quickly, how, how a swap works is that at the spot leg, uh, 
Um, the Brazilian central bank will, say, sell USD and buy real from a dealer. Then they will exchange interest payments over the duration of the contract. And then at maturity, the central bank will essentially re-exchange the... So they'll repurchase the USD and then uh, sell the real at maturity. So, so that's how a swap transaction works. It's, it's similar... Um, and this is an interest rate currency swap, or what we call a cross-currency swap. Okay, so for summary um, statistics, so as I mentioned, we have spot sale, spot purchase, traditional swap, reverse swap, and forward purchase. So the traditional swap is when the Brazilian central bank is selling USD spot and then buying uh, USD uh, forward. So we find, um, we also divide it up into unexpected and expected uh, interventions. So we find for sell interventions, most of them are unexpected. Um, for purchase, they're, they're all unexpected. There are none that are expected. Um, for traditional, um, we find actually a lot of traditional swaps are actually expected. So uh, not many are, are unexpected. And, uh, likewise, for swaps, they typically announce the day before. Um, and forward purchase is actually quite limited in our data set, so we'll be mainly focusing on the spot and traditional uh, swap uh, for analysis. So this is a, a time series of the interventions. Um, so I just plot this for unexpected, but you get a similar plot when you look at expected interventions as well. Um, so you find there's actually a lot of spot purchase interventions um, in the 2000s, um, but the spot sales start occurring towards the end of our sample, so we have a lot of spot sales that start happening around 2019. Um, and traditional swaps happen in uh, a number of periods as well, so in the 2010s. So we have some additional data. So we use, uh, to get intraday data on spot and forward, we use uh, Thomson Reuters. Um, so we have five minute uh, interval quotes for, for the uh, real uh, USD rate. Um, for interest rates, we have daily. We are currently working on, on expanding our data to include high frequency interest rates as well. Um, and we also have a measure of intermediary constraints. And the main measure that we use, and which I'll show today, is the intermediary capital risk factor um, from Hay, uh, Manella, Hay, Kelly, and Manella. And we also have a number of controls. Um, one of the key controls is, is controlling for credit risk. Um, and so we have essentially these credit spreads between sort of, sort of uh, emerging market index and uh, government bond index, for example. Okay, so just um, to be clear on the exchange rate quote, um, so our exchange rate will be expressed as units of real per USD. So an increase is a real depreciation. So I just want to be clear on, on our notation when we, when we go into the results. So an increase is a real depreciation and um, a decrease will be a real appreciation. Um, so these are our CIP deviations. We have it from one month to one year. Um, Essentially, these deviations are negative, and it's important, um, the, the direction is important because a negative basis means that the synthetic rate is higher than the direct rate, so essentially there is a net cost of, of uh, converting real to USD in, in uh, using FX uh, swap markets. And so this negative basis suggests there is some relative scarcity of obtaining uh, dollars uh, in uh, cross-border markets. Okay, so uh, here's our specification. So we use a local projections uh, method where we look at uh, the T plus H horizon of this, uh, the outcome variable um, and regress it on our intervention uh, instrument. Um, so we use the amount of, of the intervention for, for that specific instrument. And we have a dummy for same day because it's an intraday. Uh, we use hourly frequency for our analysis. So that means uh, we, we also want to control for whether the um, effects are happening intraday or the day after. Okay, and we also have a number of controls, uh, both daily and high frequency. 
So daily includes measures for credit risks, the VIX, uh, intermediary constraints, and so on. And we also have uh, high frequency controls, which are lags of the outcome variable and bid ask spreads as well. So these are our uh, first results. So on the left, we have the effect of FXI on the log of the spot rate. Um, so these are spot sa sales of USD reserves. And so we find that uh, uh, one billion spot sale of USD reserves leads to approximately uh, two, close to a 2% appreciation of the real. So the negative coefficients here um, essentially correspond to a real appreciation. Okay, so that's what we expect, that the spot sell of USD reserves leads to real appreciation. Um, for traditional swap, traditional swap is when the central bank sells real at the spot leg, but then repurchases, sorry, they sell USD at the spot leg, but repurchase USD uh, at maturity. But these swaps have very short-term effect. Um, and also the magnitude is much smaller, right? So here it's about 0.1% uh, within the hour, but then we don't really see any significant effects for the swap. Um, so now we look at CIP deviations. So here we find there is this positive impact on CIP, but I, I should be clear that when we looked at CIP, CIP is measured negative in this data, so the fact that we find uh, positive coefficients means that it's becoming less negative. So, so essentially there's an uh, alleviating of the intermediary constraints. So that's what we would expect if it's a dollar intermediation channel and it's uh, essentially reducing um, the need for, for intermediaries to supply dollars in the market when you have an, an FXI. And so that should essentially lower the uh, that should reduce the scarcity of dollar funding, and, and that's uh, consistent with our results. Um, again, for the traditional swap, we don't find a, a lot of effect um, uh, when we, in this baseline specification, but I'll show you a specification where we do find effects for traditional swaps as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to interact our FXI variable, so the amount of interventions. Um, we're going to interact it with a, this dummy uh, HKM variable, and this uh, dummy will capture periods of tight and uh, tight intermediary constraints. So essentially, if this value takes one, we have um, essentially a period of tight intermediary constraints, and then if it's zero, it's a slack intermediary constraints. And so we want to essentially test whether FXI or the effectiveness of FXI varies with intermediary constraints. And this is our results. So here the bottom 50% corresponds to periods when the dealer capital is low and um, global intermediaries are constrained. And so we find that when we have intermediaries that are constrained, we get more um, an appreciation of the real, so we get essentially our, our story for the spot rate, but then we find insignificant results when we interact our period with, interact our FXI with periods of slack intermediary constraints. So that means clearly a driver of our effects is that, that the FXI is occurring during a period of tight intermediary constraints. And what's nice is that this story can also reconcile um, some of our findings for the swap FXI. So we find that once we condition for the intermediary constraints, then we find that a swap FXI also has a uh, persistent impact when uh, in periods of tight intermediary constraints. I should still stress that the magnitude is much less than spot FXI, which again is something I, I mentioned in, in the model framework. So here it's about 0.2%, whereas uh, here it's, uh, say, closer to 2%. So there's an order of magnitude 10 difference between uh, the spot uh, FXI and the swap FXI. Okay, and um, for the intermediary constraints, again, we find stronger effects on the CIP when uh, intermediaries are, the HKM is in the bottom 50%. 
So that corresponds to periods when dealer capital is low. And we, again, we don't find very clear effects for the, for the uh, traditional swaps, but we still see in the very short term, there is a, uh, the CIP is going in the right direction for the bottom 50%. But again, our results are strongest for the uh, spot FXI. So we, we have a few uh, robustness tests. So I, I focused principally on the um, sp spot sell FXI and the traditional swap, which is when the central bank sells USD at the spot leg and then repurchases USD at the forward leg. But of course, um, you can also have spot purchases and reverse swaps. Um, so these, uh, for these ones, we don't find an impact. And so you, it, it's intuitive because if it's really about alleviating intermediary constraints um, where they're supplying USD, if you're doing a spot purchase and a reverse swap, you're actually buying uh, the central banks taking USD out of the market. Um, so it must be that in, that peri in the periods where they're doing spot purchases, they're no really um, need for USD funding at that point in time. Um, for expected versus unexpected interventions, we find that uh, our results are really only uh, significant for unexpected interventions. So there is essentially more impact when, when central banks an, uh, announce um, interventions and immediately uh, conduct the auction as opposed to announcing uh, the day before. Um, we also look at alternative measures of intermediary constraints. Um, so, of course, like the VIC's um, absolute level of CIP violations, and we also find similar patterns. So, uh, a work in progress that I just wanted uh, to highlight is also thinking about this tension between signaling and portfolio balance. And so, a lot of what we have done so far is evidence for the portfolio balance channel, right? So there's some kind of inelastic supply of dollars uh, by, by intermediaries. When the central bank comes in and sells USD, they essentially alleviate that constraint and that's, that has price effects. But signaling is also another channel um, that's uh, quite prominent in the literature. And that's the idea that if you have USD sales that could signal higher interest rates in the future um, in order to maintain the strength of the currency. Um, our preliminary findings at the high frequencies, there's no interest rate response. And I think part of it is also sterilization, as, as uh, Sarah mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, at low frequency, it's a bit tricky, and I, I, and I think that a lot of the interest rate parts start um, being dependent on kind of the state of the economy as well. So, so we're not very clear whether there's a signaling channel, but it could be there's signaling um, conditional on certain periods, right? So if, if you have a lot of, like a really strong USD um, and there's a very tight intermediary constraints, there would be more uh, likely to have an interest rate path consistent with the signaling channel. So just to conclude, um, we analyzed the high frequency effects of the Brazilian central bank's uh, FXI on both spot rates and CIP. Um, we find that the unanticipated sales have the most effect. Um, they narrow CIP deviations. Um, so, and the doll intermediation channel, our main test for that is interacting with intermediary constraints. So we find that the effects of FXI are more, most pronounced during periods of tight intermediary constraints. And we also find uh, preliminary evidence there's not much signaling of monetary policy going on at the high frequency. Um, and yes, our findings have implications for the effectiveness of FXI. So the spot, uh, unanticipated spot sales tend to have the most effect, and also how FXI could be more useful in periods of tight intermediary constraints. Thank you.
Sorry, sorry, sorry. Apologies. And it now works. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great uh, being here again. Uh, this is a very neat paper. Oh, it is on, but okay. This is a very neat paper. It is on effects interventions. You know, uh, the, I'll tell a few things about the number of effects interventions paper I've seen here this year and uh, uh, a year and a half ago. It's from Brazil. Uh, one of the innovations, brilliant innovations, is separating out this anticipated versus unanticipated interventions. But I'm going to say a few things about that. For the past uh, 20 years, they use intraday data, both on the swap spot and also uh, the futures prices, as well as some auctions data. That is uh, another uh, very uh, interesting innovation, I believe. And and they find that surprise sales of USD reserves uh, result in appreciation of real, the, the currency, and a decline in the magnitude of CIP violations. And this is consistent with dollar liquidity provision reducing the relative cost of borrowing USD via FX forward swap markets and improving efficiency. That is the conclusion uh, that they make, and they argue that uh, intermediary uh, constraints uh, do matter. It's a very nice paper, very neat paper, and it's making a very nice contribution to this theme that we were talking about, that Pierre Olivier was sort of talking about towards a rule, if you like, enhancing our understanding and moving towards a rule. But before coming to that, I want to say a few things. I grew up as an economist at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. It was a very happy, simple but very happy uh, upbringing. Exchange rate was a pure shock absorber because you know we were the commo we were commodity currency even before Ken Rogoff christened the name you know the New Zealanders Canadians Aussies they knew that even in the 80s uh, 90s the banking supervision was left to the people it was up to you to know if your bank was good or not the banking supervision was made up by six people believe it or not this is 90s uh, I'm talking about macro prudential policies were called by my bosses regulation, and it was a stigma term. And capital controls, I never heard that term. And we were just looking for inflation under every single rock. That was the only thing we were doing. And it was a simple life, good life, but that life has changed. I was warned before I moved to Asia, you know, two things matter in Asia, in emerging Asia, you know, capital controls and exchange rate, and they were so true. But the RBNZ wasn't the only place that has changed. IMF has changed too, right? Uh, what some central banks had been doing for a while, we now call that with, uh, we now call it IPF. I'm saying that in a good way. And, but in this world, the central banks are such powerful institutions with God knows how many. They might be more powerful than prime ministers or parliaments of their countries. They do monetary policy, prudential supervision, macro prudential, FXI, capital controls. When you think about the amount of scrutiny or accountability that we have around monetary policy, when it comes to FXI, capital controls, and so on, how much do we have? Probably very little. So this is what, you know, I really like hearing that from Pierre Olivier yesterday towards a rule closing the CIP deviations, for example, with FXI, FX interventions. And this paper, I believe, contributes to our understanding in that regard. So in that regard, it's a very nice paper. I really uh, enjoyed that. Uh, just a couple of, uh, uh, again, on this broader issue, a couple of uh, comments. Is FXI really an independent institution? You know, if we are sort of going to do this in tandem with interest rates, for example. I can think of two examples where central banks intervening without any effects while cutting interest rates. This is Reserve Bank of Australia during Asian financial crisis and Turkey in recent times. You know, you intervene, but you don't back it up with interest rates. So if we have to do that with interest rates, uh, is that really an independent in uh, instrument? Uh, I might be completely wrong on that, but it's a, a question that uh, I want to ask. 
So, uh, one thing, I mean, my comments are going to be on this anticipated, unanticipated thing, and a couple of estimation uh, points, uh, as opposed to uh, the theory uh, and uh, some other uh, stuff in the paper, given the time. You know, if we write this uh, forward uh, rate, a synthetic forward rate, in the way that I have in equation two, equation one, And if we sort of uh, let our uh, subscript L be the interest rate on a longer term bond, uh, we can write this uh, uh, synthetic forward or n year forward rate in terms of the change in the long term forward rate, which is the term in red, and the change in the yield curve, which is the term in uh, blue. This is, you know, Jeffrey Williamson from Davis, the commodities a, a, a futures market scholar. In his term, or in his language, spot forward schedule, if you like, you know. This is the way I think about uh, these kind of uh, things. And in that world, different types of shocks or news, including FXI, will have different effects on these variables, you know. Uh, the, the near term and spot and the forward end. If the spot exchange rate responds more to news, which can be FXI in this case, than the longer term interest rate differential, the forward rate shifts in response to news, or changes in yield curve are presented as a twist around a longer term forward. So if you like, you know, if the economic news is say the discovery of oil, the schedule would move in a parallel way, or in the case of a monetary tightening, for example, it would be a twist. So this is a, the, the way a, I think about it. But these different types of things, movements, would mean something different in terms of a, their economic intuition. Okay? Why do these matter? Because this matters in terms of how we estimate them, how people estimate them. Apart from this, except this Fast et al, Fast Rogers right in JME in 2007, the literature estimates the effects separately. Fast et al is the only one that estimates them jointly, and I believe there are good reasons to estimate them jointly. One, potentially it improves the efficiency of estimates because the errors in your three spot forward and CIP deviations, they will be probably correlated, right? Although doing this in a local projection would be very complicated. Second, the relative size of these coefficients are important or is important. Do exchange rate response by a similar amount to news or FXI, as I said earlier, as long-term bond yields? The relative size the response is a di therefore direct measure of the response of forward exchange rate to the intervention that we are making. So this joint estimation, I believe, can give us some additional information in terms of interpreting that schedule. So this anticipated, unanticipated intervention, uh, I'm a bit... It's probably my fault, it's definitely not paper's fault. Uh, when we see that second on August 27th, second uh, intervention that was unanticipated, that is the outcome variable that probably had some kind of expectations about how much central bank might be intervening following what they saw earlier in the day. We know how much central bank intervened, half a billion, say, but did the markets expect something different, more? Therefore, the outcome over there might not necessarily be in response to half a billion, the unexpected component for which we have nothing. So uh, I am wondering if, this are, if these are really truly expected and unexpected components. Another comment, uh, Dimitri mentioned a couple of structural estimation, the need for currency demand. Uh, I wonder if this is one place 
where I/O type structural estimation, given the amount of auctions data that you have, this is one place that uh, one could use, utilize that uh, I/O type structural estimation, because those guys see these things as a product, and there is a market structure, and I'm going to estimate demand curve. And because it is structural, then one can do a lot of great counterfactuals. And uh, one ex example of that is Hortachu McAdams paper, but these models are becoming more and more popular in macro, especially financial markets. But as far as I know, in exchange rates, it, it, there is no uh, application of these models. Uh, some minor models, uh, just uh, out of curiosity, what happens to other currency pairs? Uh, i.e. real, Canadian dollar, real, euro, do they respond and what they mean, just out of curiosity. Uh, monetary policy, we talked about that. The final minor economic comment is one problem, oh, one problem people, not problem, issue people discuss a lot these days in terms of these local projections is the controls. This is very similar to an older paper by Josh Angrist on the controls in the two-stage least squares, the first stage of that, and some people are using, when you have too many controls, people are using machine learning, and they find that one can get a lot of uh, mileage uh, out of that. Anyway, just to conclude, this really was a very neat paper. As I said, it really adds to our knowledge and understanding of CIP deviations, FX interventions, and that's all, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you, Yosin, for your comments. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, so I, on the point about um, the signaling and this interest rate response, so I agree that's a bit of a confound when we looked at our interest rate parts, that um, there could be episodes where you do an FXI but also lower interest rates, and that would essentially counter the, the signaling channel that we, we hypothesize. Um, so yeah, we need to think a bit more about how to do signaling and, and I think the high frequency is the best way where it's a, sort of a cleaner identification. Um, and on the other points um, about the forward uh, rates, so actually I forgot to mention that as a robustness, but we, we look at forward premium as well separately. And so we find uh, the forward premium response in a way that's consistent with the CIP effect. So essentially that it really is driving um, changes in the forward premium. So, so that's kind of the channel through which uh, it should affect all intermediation. And um, in terms of yeah, expected versus unexpected, yeah, I'm happy to talk more about kind of ways to, to disentangle this. Because I agree that even with the unexpected, like clearly they're responding to something during that day. So. So I agree that the timing, um, there's, a, there's a lead up to the unexpected announcements as well. It might be interesting to look at what's happening uh, prior to these announcements. Um, and yeah, so, so yeah, we're also happy to like review some of the, the specification uh, as well. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. Uh very interesting paper. I'm looking forward to reading the first draft when it's out. Um, more like a comment than a question. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this paper by Eugenio Shiruti and Hanran Chu. I probably mispronounced the names. Um, they have a paper on CIP deviations in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And what they find is they differentiate between onshore and offshore markets, uh, FX markets. And they find that um, onshore markets are usually um, more insulated from global risk whereas offshore markets are more exposed to risk. I was wondering, I mean, if I remember correctly, Brazil has an active onshore market and an offshore market. I guess um, most of your contracts are in the onshore market, which I think is bigger, but it would be interesting to see whether, um, you know, there's also intervention <laughs> in the offshore market, and if so, what does the central bank uh, respond to? other than um, intermediaries um, risk-bearing capacity, their balance sheet constraints. And on that note, um, 
so the, Shiruti and uh, Shu, they, they also use this He Kelly uh, Manella measure, but they focus only on FX primary um, dealers. So I think the He Kelly Manella uses like all 50 primary dealers, but they focus only on the FX one. So you may want to narrow that to, to um, see if your results remain robust to that. Yeah. Th thank you, that's great. Um, just quick, quick response. Yeah, so I am happy to check out this onshore versus offshore. So we, we use non-deliverable forwards, and so I'm also not sure about whether, whether that's onshore. Or, I think it might be offshore actually, but I think it's interesting to compare the two, and I'll also uh, check this alternative HKM measure as well. Uh, so very interesting, and I understand that the main contribution is empirical, but one theoretical question, because I'm just curious, you showed these results, the differences between uh, spot market interventions and um, uh, swap, right? And you had, it looked like permanent effect on the exchange rate if you do spot market intervention, which is very surprising. So is it because that uh, they just take currency away from the market and never give it back? Because it was a two-period model, right? And you had the depreciation in both periods, which kind of violates country's budget constraints. So it seems like I, I can only imagine that if they kind of destroy, they take this money away, this, this currency away, and they kind of destroy it. Otherwise, yes. I, uh, it seems surprising. Yeah, yeah, so we don't, yeah, we don't factor this into the, the intertemporal budget constraints. So it is essentially like left out in period two. But yeah, we just wanted to make the point that you, when you have a swap, you know, you sell USD and then you repurchase USD, so there will be this like natural reversal. And if you have spot, you should get more persistence. But I agree that from a theoretical point of view, we kind of made an assumption there. Thank, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question was around the unexpected versus unexpected um, kind of events that you have. And I was, maybe I just misunderstood, but I was wondering why you don't consider the announcement itself as a, a shock, meaning it seems to me that you kind of, you're throwing away all these announcements. I say, tomorrow I'm gonna do something, and that's obviously expected, that something, and you rightly so, you don't consider it. But why not using the, the fact that I'm saying, tomorrow I'm gonna do something to do identification? You know, I would expect if there is only one day delay, given that the FX market is straight, you know, you have, Trade is traded 24 7 and it's very liquid and you know it's forward looking enough so that you should have meaningful variation around those announcements. I would think that it would be an you know you, you should be able to find something there and I think this is important because if, as far as I understand most of the interventions are, are done on derivatives rather than spots while by as a, as a byproduct of your approach you end up with a sample that is dominated by spots and very little derivative interventions. So I'm always, when you compare spot and derivatives interventions, I'm, I'm wondering how much this kind of sel sample selection that you're effectively, effectively doing matters for the results that you find. Thank you. Right, so that's a good point. Um, so the expected interventions in our data set, they always have the announcement that typically the day before, and it always gives a timestamp of like 6 p.m. And so because markets close, we find that it's difficult to use the announcement timestamp of the previous evening, but we, we still looked at expected um, on the day of the operation, like from the beginning of trading hours, and we find no real effects. But yeah, it's just hard to use the announcement timestamp for the, when, when it's uh, at end of day. Uh, two, two questions. Uh, one is, um, can, you, can you observe the maturity of the swaps in which uh, the interactions are made? And then relatedly, I guess, do you see any effect on the day when these swaps are actually expiring? Because I guess essentially, you know, dollars supplied back to the market. And then second, due to the importance of the futures markets in Brazil, in terms of trading volume, do you see any effect on liquidity conditions or, you know, prices in futures markets? Um, thank you. So, yes, we we can do analysis. We, we're still working on kind of looking at uh, biometric 
yeah, it's an interesting idea to look at when, when you have expiring of contracts as well, which we haven't done. And we, we can also look at kind of uh, volume in, in futures trading as well. So there was a very nice paper at another conference uh, that Giovanni knows where Paul Hubert and his co-authors showed that when the ECB implements exactly the same bond buying program but announces different aims for it, it ends up having different market impacts. Now I think that's relevant here in that, um, you know, when you were thinking, when, when you first said, uh, you know, whether there would be monetary policy signaling, I was thinking, why on earth would there be, right? You know, this is a clear effects intervention for effects purposes. But that's the world that I'm living in these days. Now, and, and to me, naturally, you don't find this. But if this were to happen, say, in Japan, during the zero lower bound, and the Bank of Japan was intervening in the effects market, with the implication that this actually is their way of trying to do expansion and monetary policy, that, I am sure, would have monetary policy signaling effects, very much like QE had effects on you know, a commitment device for monetary policy. So I think that result probably is not a generalizable result in that um, in Brazil, people took it to be a separate, from separate from general monetary policy stance, effects intervention, just to you know, stabilize the effect, uh, effects market purposes. But it doesn't mean that if some other central bank or the central bank of Brazil at some other time did a similar intervention, it would also have the same flavor. And I think that's, um, that's a consequential um, thing to think about generalizing this result. Thank you. Um, yeah, just quickly, yes, so I agree with you that the in motives can be kind of case by case. And that so um, in this case, uh, it looks like from our high frequency evidence as well, we are not really finding any interest rate uh, response. And so it, and I agree that it, it does uh, depend a lot on kind of state of the economy, wh wh whether interest rates will, will respond to, to FXI as well. So no more questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.